About a year and a half ago, we began our deacon selection process, and Brian Williams uh, was one of the men chosen to participate in our deacon training. And so about 18 months later now, we present Brian to you this morning uh, to give him an opportunity to share a little bit of his testimony and a little bit of his heart and maybe a little bit of his journey over these past over this past year and a half. Let me pray for Brian as he prepares to share with you. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for my friend Brian. And I just ask that you would just calm any nerves that he has and just remind him of what this place means to him and how you've been at work in him in and through this place. And God, we just speak through from his heart, through his mouth. I pray these things for Brian. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Justin. Um, so first of all, I've now realized I should have made this font just a little larger before I got up here because um, I don't have my glasses. Um, if any of y'all here last week, I've got to settle the record straight on one thing. So last week, I'm sitting out in the back, John Evans and Justin's talking, he brings out his phone and said, well, somebody, people would text me, namely Brian Williams. And John goes, you just got called out. So I can tell you absolutely, without a doubt, 100%, I have done that before. That was 100% factual, so I can't, I can't say anything. Um, and wow, what a testimony from Wade last week, too, to follow. So uh, amen to that. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm married to my wife, Chaley, for 15 years. Absolutely. Uh, I have three kids, Allie, who will be 14 on Wednesday, Eli, that's 11, and Leah is 9. Um, Chaley and I have been married 15 years. Uh, my journey as a Christian, I was saved at about the age of 12, like a lot of us were, at a youth revival in the First Baptist Church in Broken Bow, Oklahoma. Um, and, you know, was active in church through school, high school, got to college, and then on to medical school, and then into training, and I was sort of a, kind of a holiday church goer. When I got convicted, I would go. When I was home, I would go. Um, but was not a regular tender, wasn't actively involved in church. Um, Chaley and I got married and really, you know, started thinking about it, talking, realizing that we needed to join a church, need to be active. Um, and then we had kids. And it was pretty obvious at that point, you know, that, that something had to change, that we had to get involved, that we needed help. And I don't mean diaper changing help, we needed spiritual help. And we tried out a lot of different churches and we were involved in a church plan at one time and started visiting here at Oakdale. And I don't know if we have the record. We could be pretty close for the amount of years visiting before we join. Um, and, you know, so much as you stand in front, I didn't get, well, hey, we're glad to have you. It was, I thought you were already a member. But the one thing I want to talk to and what thing is dear to my heart is the reason a little bit behind that and why we visited for so long. Chaley was raised in the Catholic Church, and I was obviously raised Baptist, so Joining a Baptist church for me was, was no big deal. I was there. It was new. It was different to her. And I saw through those four years of visiting here, her growth, her studying, her servanthood here, and just a transformation in becoming a spiritual leader to our kids. And that caused me to step up my game. And and I'm just, I'm thankful for that. She has a servant heart, and she makes me better. So, I, I can't believe I said I wasn't going to get emotional or anything. But um, The deacon nomination came up, and I can't believe that's been 18 months ago either. Um, but first, I can say when I was chosen for that, I was humbled and honored and scared. I didn't know what it meant, you know. For those of you who grew up, I mean, I grew up in a church, and the deacons sat at the back. They took the offering plates and mostly dozed off during the service. You know, and that, that, that was what a deacon was to me. And so at the time, I was, you know, working a lot and, and busy. I, I'm an ER doctor by, by trade. I still work clinically about one or two days a week, but the rest of my time is spent in management. And at the time, I was actually in an eight-week somewhat interview process for a role in our company that would have been as a senior vice president. 
which would require travel. I would have been from California to Washington to Phoenix, and I'm like, am I going to have time for this? Because in my heart, I was, everybody would tell me, hey, you're going to get this job. You've kind of been groomed for this job. It's going to be yours. And I prayed, I really prayed for God to do in my heart and lead me where I was supposed to be going, which in my mind included getting that job. I thought, well, this is a shoe in you know. Well, it turns out that I didn't get that job, and it was a punch in the stomach for me. Because unlike Justin, who says, well, you know, when you're in the kickball line and people are picking sides, he was the last one to go. I was not. <laughs> Let's be clear. I was always one of the first ones chosen to play kickball. And so that, I mean, it was an ego shot for me, right? That somebody didn't, really, you didn't choose me for this, you know? But then I kind of had to remember what I was praying for. And I wasn't praying for that job. I was praying for direction in what I was supposed to be doing. And, you know, it took some time for me to figure out that what I was supposed to be doing was maybe spending a little less time work-related and a little more time serving my family, my church. And, you know, and it came up, and, and Dan, that leads our community group, is president of the Dental Association, has had some time away to give me the opportunity to, you know, lead our community group at times. It, it's been a huge blessing for me. And I really think not getting that position was probably the best thing that's happened to me in a long time. Um, and so I, I'm just thankful that, you know, God's leading me to serve, whether it's in the deacon candidacy or what, um, that I'm, I'm committed to that. And I, I just am humbled beyond belief about the opportunity uh, to do that. I'll pray now. Lord, God, I thank you for this church body. God, I thank you for this family that we have here. I thank you for all that you've blessed us with, and I thank you for what is to come here, God. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity that I have and that we all have to serve you, God, and to serve one another here. Most of all, I thank you for sacrifice and for the ultimate sacrifice that you gave for us, God. Uh, it, just, it just blows me away. I ask all things in his name. Amen. Well, let me, uh, let me start by setting the real record straight, which is I never said I was the last one picked in the kickball game, okay? <laughs> so I don't know, somebody wasn't listening, may have been snoozing a little, but uh, some confusion about that. Uh, let, me, uh, let me mention something to you real quickly before we jump into uh, our message this morning. Uh, this Wednesday night, we will be finishing up a Bible study we've been doing since the beginning of the school year. And next Wednesday night, a week from Wednesday night, we will start a couple of new adult classes. Uh, one class uh, on the book of Job, which is just one of my favorite books of the Bible. So interesting, a lot to learn. Uh, our associate pastor, Paul, is going to be teaching that. And then I'm going to be teaching what we call the pastor's class for new and non-members. And uh, just before I say anything about it, how many of you here this morning at some point in the, in the past, have been a part of that class with me. Raise your hand if you would. So look around, and you see easily 75%, 80 percent of us have been a part of this class. And I will just say this. It's a 12-week commitment, 6 o'clock on Wednesday nights. And if you are interested in church membership, this is a class for you. If you are just interested in knowing more about what Oakdale is all about, this is the class for you. And listen, you may have been a church member for a while and just never had had the opportunity to take this class. And if you haven't, we would love to have you. Uh, but we want to ask you to get signed up for it. On our website, there is a place for you to register for this class. If you will do that, then we will make sure we provide the materials for you free of charge. And uh, we get started in a couple of weeks, and we look forward to having you be a part of that. So please, if you would, consider that class. It's really important to your understanding of who we are, and it's an important part of us bringing you into the family here at Oakdale Baptist Church. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 1 this morning, so if you have your Bible, uh, you're going to look for that in the Old Testament. Also, you have some notes inside your bulletin that look like this, and I just encourage you to use those to kind of follow along with us. We are in week two of our three-week series called Listen, 
where last week I told you that the American, the average American spends between 11 and 13 hours per day receiving information from their smartphones, their uh, computers, their TVs, and other media devices. And we agreed that when you spend so much time plugged into something, receiving information, uh, stimulation, and entertainment, that device is going to have a lot of influence in your life. Well, in the same way, we said that there are people and things that we listen to and that we don't listen to when it comes to seeking advice, wisdom, and direction. And we learned that who and what you listen to will greatly influence how you live your life in both negative ways and in positive ways. And so last week we talked about the right people to listen to and the wrong people to listen to. Today we're going to talk about what it means to listen specifically to the voice of wisdom. Now Proverbs chapter 1 was written by King Solomon and it is all about wisdom. And the interesting thing is that in Proverbs chapter 1, when Solomon talks about wisdom, he makes wisdom a she. Okay? You need to know that and understand that. Solomon makes wisdom a she, and he says that wisdom, contrary to what we typically, the way we typically think about it, wisdom is not a woman we have to chase after. Okay? He says that. He says wisdom is like a woman who wants to be heard, like a woman shouting in the streets for anybody who will listen. Now, before we go any further, let's define what wisdom is. Wisdom basically is making decisions based on how the world God created really works, okay? Just kind of a simplified definition. Wisdom is making decisions based on how the world God created really works. For example, you should wear a seatbelt. Now, that is just wise. It's also a law, but even before it was a law, and how how many of you remember uh, being able to sit, crawl, lay anywhere in your car going 75 miles an hour down the highway? Yes. Okay, so... Youngsters, uh, believe it or not, there was a time when wearing a seatbelt was not a law. Our parents did not love us like we love you, clearly, okay? But even before it became a law, it was still wise to wear a seatbelt, just based on, on what we can observe about life, about the world around us, and things like gravity, okay? That's why it's wise. Uh, I'll give you another example. Guys, if you're dating a girl, now listen to me, okay, this is good stuff. If you're dating a girl and it's feeling kind of serious, you should spend time with her family. Trust me, you just should, okay? It's, I'm telling you, you don't want to meet them at the rehearsal dinner, okay? This is not a bad idea. This is not wise at all. Now, there's no law that says you have to do this, but wisdom says you should spend time with your girlfriend's family. And that is how wisdom kind of works in this world. How should I act with my finances, my health, my relationships, based on the way the world God created actually works? But to do that, we need to know as much as we can about wisdom. And so Solomon has that information in the book of Proverbs chapter 1. We're going to begin with verse 20, if you're following along with me, and you'll see the scripture on the screen behind me. And it says this, out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On the top of the wall, she cries out at the city gates, she makes her speech. And so Solomon starts off by saying, wisdom is a woman willing to share what she knows with anyone and everyone who will listen. And then in verse 22, she points out to us three kinds of people who especially need to hear what she has to say. Verse 22, how long, he says, will you who are simple love your simple ways? Now, simple in this context means naive. And so the first category I'm going to have you write down is simple or naive people. Now understand, this is not meant to be insulting because if you think about it, naive does not mean dumb. Naive basically refers to a person who has just not lived long enough in this world to understand 
everything about how this world works. You can have a high IQ, make straight A's in school, have a full ride to, co- to, to college, but if you're 18, you're 18. And you know all that you know, but there's a lot that you don't know. That's not insulting, that's just reality. And so wisdom says, how long will those of you who are naive love your naive ways? How long will you refuse to acknowledge or listen to those who are older, maybe wiser, those with greater experience that could be learned from? Then wisdom goes on to a second category. How long will mockers delight in mockery? And so the second category of people are mockers. Now, a mocker is simply someone who makes fun of other people who listen to wisdom, often makes fun of religious people. A mocker is someone, and and we've probably all experienced this, who has a tendency to make fun of people who want to do the right thing. Oh, you want to do the right thing. Well, isn't that cute? Isn't that precious? There are things you do not want to say in front of a mocker because they are just very overt in making fun of people. And so wisdom says, how long, mockers, are you going to delight in your mockery? And then the third question, verse 22, and how long will fools hate knowledge? And so the third category is foolish people. Now, what exactly is a fool? You say, well, a fool is someone who is stupid. No. A a fool is ignorant. Not quite. A fool is actually someone, think about this, who knows the right thing to do, but doesn't, come on, fill in the blank, doesn't do it. Okay. They know the right thing to do, but they don't care. Um, You know that that's going to hurt you, right? I know. Well, then why are you doing it? I don't care. Okay, end of conversation, right? I mean, how do you you argue with that? They just don't care. They know what to do. Doesn't matter to them. So wisdom says, how long will fools hate knowledge? In other words, how long will you fools refuse to learn? How long will you go before you begin to pay attention? And so wisdom is out in the streets. It's addressing everybody, and she says, those of you who are naive, who are mockers or foolish, how long are you going to ignore reality? Then wisdom goes on in verse 23. Repent at my rebuke. She says, look, I want you to listen to me. I want you to hear what I have to say to you. For those of you who are naive, that means you've got to admit that there is more to life than the way that you see it. For those of you who are mockers, that means you're going to have to lift your head up out of your arrogance and acknowledge that putting other people down does not in any way lift you up. And for those of you who think you've got it all figured out, but you just don't care, you've got to realize that you're being foolish. And she says, of all three categories, repent. She says to each group, I'm willing to teach you and I'm willing to instruct you, but you have to make a decision to turn away from your simplicity, away from your mockery, away from your foolishness, and listen to what I have to say. Now, there are two really big takeaways in this passage. And in verse 23, we find the first one. She says in verse 23, then... Then, in other words, after you decide, I'm going to listen to wisdom. After you decide, I'm going to turn away from my foolishness. After you recognize that you can only know so much. After you decide that mocking people doesn't actually benefit you. Then, she says, I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teachings. Now listen to me, this is huge. Here's what wisdom says. Wisdom says, I want you to be wise. Think about that. I want you. I desire for you. I'm going to make a way for you to be wise. I want you to make the best decisions possible based on reality and the way the world God created actually works. 
And wisdom says, I am more than willing to pour my thoughts into your mind and my spirit into your heart. I'm willing to make that work for you. But first, what do you have to do? You've got to repent. You've got to turn in my direction. You've got to listen to me. And only then will I pour out my thoughts into you. Now, as I was studying this, I couldn't help but think about how this relates to where we are as a nation in terms of our national debt. There was actually a, an article in the Daily Oklahoman this morning about our na- national debt, and, and it's skyrocketing, and it just looks like it's going to continue to grow. And, and let me ask this. Anybody know what the current U.S. national debt is? Anybody have any idea what it is? I see a couple of people shaking their head. It's around 17 million, seven, I'm sorry, that's not right, 17 trillion dollars, okay? Depends on where you look, but basically about 17 trillion, that's pretty amazing, is it not? And you know, regardless of, of your political persuasion, regardless of who you voted for or voted against over the last 50 years, isn't it true that we as a nation could have and probably would have avoided putting ourselves in the position we're in if we as a nation and a culture had decided to listen to the voice of wisdom. But we didn't, right? Why? You say, because they are fools. No, because we are fools. We put them there. Did we or did we not? We're the fools, okay? We probably knew better. But as people, we kind of mock that that kind of thing. In a lot of ways, we're naive. And now individually, and as families, and as a company, and as a nation, we can look out into our future, and we can see the coming consequences of some of our terrible, terrible, foolish decisions. And if we as a nation had ever asked, think about this, what is the wise thing to do based on how the world we live in actually works, we probably wouldn't have done many of the things economically that we did as a nation, and we would not have done many of the things that we have done as an individual. Yes or no? If we thought about what the wise thing to do is. But the problem is, we didn't listen to the voice of wisdom. We have other voices that we like to listen to. For example, we listen to the voice of greed. We listen to the voice of greed. Now, by definition, greed is an almost uncontrollable desire for more than we even need. Greed causes us to put an inappropriate value on things that that we just do not have. And greed is just something that kind of comes natural to us. The other voice we tend to listen to is the voice of discontentment. You've probably heard me talk about this a lot if you've been around Oakdale for a while. The voice of discontentment. This is the voice that is constantly telling us that we need a newer one, a shinier one, or a smaller one, or a bigger one, right? Whatever it is, we just need a new one of it. And while greed causes us to put an inappropriate value on things we don't have, discontentment causes us to devalue the things that we do have. Do you see how it works? Now, the the natural consequence of listening to the voices of greed and discontentment is that we stop listening to the voice of wisdom. And what's amazing is the Bible predicts all of that about us, even though it was written thousands and thousands of years before anybody in this room was even born. Listen to the voice of wisdom and and what she says next in verse 24. But since you refuse to listen when I call, and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, since you disregard all my advice and you do not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh When disaster strikes you, I will mock when calamity overtakes you. Now, you have to admit, that's a hard word. I mean, that's not the happy part of of the sermon. I, in turn, will laugh when disaster strikes you. You say, that does not sound a lot like, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But remember something. This is really important. 
This isn't God specifically speaking. This isn't even Solomon, who is the wisest man known in history, speaking. This is wisdom speaking. And remember that wisdom is making decisions based on how the world God created works. And when you and I, in spite of how the world works, decide to do something different with our health, with our bodies, with our relationships, with our families, with our money, with our education. You name the arena. When we try to make life work against the grain of wisdom, there is always a price to be paid. Wisdom says, okay, you don't want to listen to me. You don't want to turn in my direction. You want to listen to these other voices. Then I'm going to laugh when disaster strikes. And I'm telling you, if you're a, a teenager and you got most of your life ahead of you, or, or if you're a few years into marriage, or you're starting anything brand new, I just hope that you'll pay attention to this because there is actually a promise here. Here's the promise. When we refuse to listen to the voice of wisdom, disaster will strike. Now, let me stop right there and, and let me just say this. Hear me, okay? Okay. You can live according to the voice of wisdom, and disaster can still strike. Yes or no? It can happen. It just does. You know what that's called? Four letters. It's called life. That's exactly right. It's life. You can live exactly the way wisdom says, and and you can still have disaster. But the promise is, is if you do not live according to the voice of wisdom, if you don't listen to the voice of wisdom, disaster will strike. And and again, this is cause and effect. This is the principle of reaping and sowing. The Bible teaches that over time, you know, not necessarily next Thursday or or next week, maybe not even next year, but over time, eventually, when we refuse to listen to the voice of wisdom, disaster will strike. Now, what does this disaster look like? Well, maybe this is just symbolic disaster. Let's let's see what wisdom says in verse 27. She gives us some pretty powerful imagery right here. Verse 27, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you. So she's describing what disaster looks like. And any guesses as to the literal translation of the word whirlwind? Any of you who grew up in Oklahoma ought to get, be able to guess what that translated word is. It's tornado. That is exactly right. It's tornado. Basically, disaster is about to bear down upon you like an Oklahoma twister, is, is what wisdom is saying to us. And, and with it comes distress and trouble that will be more than you can handle. That's basically what wisdom is saying. And what I need you to see is that These are all promises. These are all warnings. These are all predictions based on the principle that when we stop listening to wisdom, disaster will strike. Then in verse 28, we find the the second big takeaway in the passage. And, And from my experience, this is the hardest one to ever convince someone of. And yet as a pastor, I think because I've, I've sat on both ends of this so many times with so many different kinds of people, this is the part of, me- of the message I wish I knew how to better explain. But listen to what wisdom says. Again, in verse 28, then, now if you have your Bible open, underline that word, and let me explain what then means in this case. Then means after calamity strikes. Are you with me? After we're beginning to feel the pain of our decision. After the doctor says, you know, you've been abusing your body for 20 years. After you realize that you may not graduate on time. After somebody files for divorce. After there's a bankruptcy. After we finally face what we're going to face because we would not listen to the voice of wisdom. Wisdom says, then, are you ready for this? Then, verse 28, they will call to me. In other words, then they will call a counselor. Hi, uh, my husband and I are having some problems, and I need to make an appointment to see a counselor. Okay, absolutely. Uh, How long have these problems been going on? Oh, I'd say about 17 years. Then, right? And a lot of times it's then that we started going back to church. 
And, and look, maybe you're here today because calamity struck in your life. And you, and you don't know where else to turn. And you thought, well, I'll try this church you know, on the hill. And, and now you're thinking, did somebody email him before he wrote this sermon? He just described my entire life. Listen, I, I don't need an email, okay? I'm telling you, you should read this. It's all in here. Your life is in here. It's all there. It's, it's not a mystery when it comes to what we're talking about. Decision making should be so much easier, but the Bible won't read or study itself. You see, so many times it's only after we feel the pain. It's only after the storm hits, after calamity strikes, then, then will we call out to God. Then, the Bible says, then they will call to me. And you know what? In that situation, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is, because of God's grace, because of everything we read in the New Testament, God will take you back. You are not too far gone. You say, Justin, you, you don't know what I've done. I don't need to. God's grace is absolutely unconditional as long as you're willing to come back to him, okay? And that is the good news. But the bad news is this. The way life really works is there are consequences that may or may not ever go away, okay? That's how this world that God created actually works. There is pain that may always be there. There are memories that, that there's no magic prayer that will erase it. And if you, for a period of your life, have shut out the voice of wisdom, wisdom says it may be difficult to discern her voice again. Verse 28, then they will call out to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me, since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. You see, if an individual couple family, business, or nation goes for years and years and years and shuts out the voice of wisdom, then when things get bad, they say, okay, now I'm ready to listen. Wisdom says, look, it may be difficult for you to hear my voice. It may be impossible for you to discern what I'm trying to say to you. Do, I'm asking you, do you hear what I'm saying? Because you got so good, wisdom says, at shutting me out it may be very difficult for you to ever let me in again. Now understand, this principle does not apply to the forgiveness of God. His forgiveness is available to everyone at any time. And this does not apply to the compassion of God because at the cross, he proved once and for all that he has compassion for all people. This is a message about what happens in our life, that if we refuse to listen to the voice of wisdom, there is a price that we will pay. And, and where this is so difficult for me as a pastor sometimes is when somebody will come in who's you know, kind of lost their way, and with as much compassion as there is in me, I have to say to them, you know, those are really good questions, but understand there's really not a magic pill there's not a magic verse. There's not a magic prayer. And just as you have spent weeks or months or years of your life ignoring the voice of wisdom and digging yourself a pit, it may take a long, long time to climb out. Because that's the world that we live in. And it is not because God doesn't love you. He loves you so much, he gave you this warning thousands of years before you were even born. Do you see that? But there's not an instant fix because that's not how the world God created actually works. And then listen to how wisdom finishes up, verse 30. Since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. And that means there will always be consequences. You can't vote your way out, blame your way out, sue your way out, unmarry your way out. There are going to be consequences for certain decisions. Verse 32, for the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of the fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. 
Come on, that's, that's a pretty compelling promise, isn't it? That means that, that whatever or wherever you are in your journey, if this is brand new to you or you're early on in life and, and you really haven't made any big bad decisions yet, it means you can get this right to begin with. That's pretty important to know. The question is, do you want to? It means for those of us who dug a pretty big hole in some season of our life, and listen, I'll be the first one to tell you, I dug a big, beautiful, ugly, deep hole early on in my life. So you may have experienced some things like that in yours. Let me tell you something, shutting out the voice of wisdom and the influence of God and anybody else who tried to tell us what we didn't want to hear was not a good choice for us. Wisdom says, listen to me, even if you did that, there's hope. Do you hear me? There's hope. There's hope no matter what you've done because at any point, at any moment, you can say, wisdom, I want to hear. Wisdom, I want to listen. Wisdom, I want you to put your thoughts into my thoughts. Wisdom, I've been away for a long time, and so it may take a long time, but I want to learn to walk in you. And then from this point forward, that means listening to wisdom in every situation, every decision that you have to make by asking this clarifying question that many of you have heard me ask, especially if you come on Wednesday nights and we, we, we work through and study the Bible, you hear me say this all the time, this question, is this the wise thing for me to do? I bet I've asked it a thousand times in terms of our church over the past 14 years. Is this a wise thing for me to do? In light of my past experience, current reality, future dreams, my relationship with God, the principles found in his word, and the way that the world God designed works, is this the wise thing to do? Because I'm telling you, if you will seek out wisdom, God is willing to answer. And so here's the question. Are you listening to the voice of wisdom right now? Or are you too smart for this? Would you be willing to ask of your marriage, of your finances, or your lifestyle, of what you're doing at work in every area of your life, would you be willing to say, just for a moment, I'm going to shout out, the, I'm sorry, I'm going to shut out the voices of greed and I'm going to shut out the discontentment and the culture and I'm just going to invite wisdom into the equation and ask God the question, God, is this the wise thing to do? I'm telling you, if, if you begin to ask that question, you not only invite wisdom into the decision-making process, you've invited in the voice of your heavenly Father who loves you and cannot wait to help you make decisions based on how the world he created actually works. I want you to bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, for some of us, this is very convicting, not because we're facing any big storm or consequence, but because we know we shut out wisdom a long time ago. God, for some of us, this explains our current reality, maybe in a way we've never understood before. It's no wonder that we are where we are. Father, this can be a hard message to hear, but I pray it would be a message of hope and God, I thank you that at the cross you demonstrated once and for all that no one is ever outside the bounds of your love and your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. That that door is wide open to every single person here in this room, regardless of what we've done. And so God, with all of that in mind, would you give each of us the wisdom to know what to do with what we've heard today? Father, will you help us to trust that it's never too late to call on you? God, will you help us to believe that you love us that much? Help us seek wisdom in our life, in our church, in our family, in our nation. In Jesus' name I pray.